Hello, everyone. Welcome to this Ecole de Modernité lecture. I'm very happy to have you all of you here, here uh, to um, and to welcome Griselda Pollock. Griselda Pollock is Professor Emerita of Social and Critical Histories of Art at the University of Leeds. And she previously taught in many um, other universities, including Canterbury College of Art, Reading University, and she also taught in Manchester. And I think it is fair to say that her work has marked the recent history of art history as much as it's marked art historians of my generation by raising questions and imposing subjects that were not so much discussed before and by interrogating our constructions of mythologies. Um, her work, um, as I'm fairly sure everyone here knows, but it's still worth um, reminding, um, has been seminal in the development of many uh, visual art studies. And it focuses on the critical analysis of culture, history, and art histories. Um, her numerous publications include several landmarks books, and uh, I will only be able to quote a few, uh, but among them, I'd like to mention, of course, uh, The Old Mistresses, Women, Art and Ideology that was published in 1981 with uh, Rosica Parker. And um, I've been told that it is currently being translated and published into French. Um, um, so um, it took time, but um, uh, it will be now available to a French reading audience. Um, She's also the author of Killing Men and Dying Women, A Woman's Touch in the Cold Zone of 1950s American Painting, published in 1996, Differentiating the Canon, Feminist Desire and the Writing of the Art Histories in 1999, Vision and Difference, Feminism, Feminity, and the Histories of Art in 2003, Museums After Modernism, Strategies of Engagement in 2007, um, she also published on Charlotte Solomon um, in 2018. And, uh, and that brings us to tonight's uh, lecture's subject. She is preparing the publication of Women in Art, Ellen Rosenau's Little Book of 1944. Um, and um, I'd like to quote uh, the title uh, Griselda Pollock gave to this lecture. Uh, because it's um, quite interesting by itself. Uh, now you see them, now you don't. Uh, that's the title. And the subtitle is Our Feminity, Modernity, Representation, Rethinking the 20th Century uh, with Women in Mind. And um, um, we'll see that it doesn't necessarily only mean uh, women artists, but also women art historians, since it will start with um, the study and uh, the interrogation of Ellen Rosenau's book, Women in Art. Um, and it will draw on, um, I think, the paradox that um, the contemporary situation, uh, that is the broader recognition and exhibition and study of um, women artists um, uh, means uh, facing the way they are uh, interrogated, displayed, um, and discussed. Um, but I shall not talk more. And um, Griselda, the uh, floor is yours. Thank you so very, very much, Hugo. I am extremely honored to have been invited to join you all. Welcome to you all virtually. It's thrilling to know that there are so many people interested in sharing this conversation with us. So thank you, Hugo. Thank you to the Fondation Giacometti. And the I love the idea of the Ecole des Modernités. Anything with plurals in it is always important to me, the diversity of it. So um, Hugo is quite right. My most recent program, but it actually is published. It came out um, physically in November, but it's now launched January because it's the 80th anniversary since the book that you see on the left-hand side, Woman in Art from Type to Personality by Dr. Helen Rosenau appeared in 1944. So my lecture is partly about this and introducing the author, Helen Rosenau, a very important feminist art historian. Uh, and the question that there was a feminist art history in 1944, 
this is quite perhaps shocking to people to understand that uh, feminist art history did not begin when Linda Nochlin asked why have there been no great women artists. It's a much longer history of women interrogating the history of art from a feminist questioning point of view. That's not necessarily talking about women artists, but about understanding art in relation to some of the big issues that the larger philosophical project of feminism poses. So Helen Rosenauer was born in 1900, uh, died in 1984, was born in Monaco. Her family were physicians. She moved, they moved from the kind of spa town of Monaco to the Bad Kissingen, Germany. She has wonderful art historical credentials. She studies for her undergraduate work with Heinrich Werflin in Munich in the early 20s, as he's formulating some of his most fundamental principles for art history. He is, she is one of the first doctoral students of Erwin Panofsky, very young, getting his professorship at the newly founded University of Hamburg, where she studies architectural form. She does a habilitation, habilitation in Bonn, but it's interrupted by the rise of the, uh, the right wing, the fascists, and she loses her, her um, scholarship. So she flees to London, where she begins a second habilitation at the Courtauld Institute in London, which was the first institute for art history that had only been founded in 1932. So she's one of the first PhD students there. And this is, in fact, on the history of the synagogue, which is a strange thing for a German Jewish refugee to do in the 1930s, where it is was believed that the Germans would conquer Britain, and her name was on the blacklist that the SS drew up of people to be arrested and destroyed almost immediately. So it's interesting. And she lectured in a number of ways and ended up teaching at Manchester University and concluding her studies, her teaching there just four years before I went to my first academic post at the University of Manchester. And she was known for 18th century architecture and Jewish studies. So what is she doing, in a sense, writing this little book? And it's a little book. It's literally about, you know, four centimeters by 11 centimeters. It's not a great big, heavy tome. It's a paperback in 1940. It's designed by someone deeply influenced by both Dutch and Bauhaus typography and book design. You can see it's ring bound in plastic, it's paperback. Uh, it was not expensive, it's short, 100 pages. It has footnotes, it's purely academic, but at the same time, it's accessible. Completed in November 1943, published in 44, but not at the Courtauld Institute or the Warburg Institute, which had come to London in the late 30s. But it was hosted at the London School of Economics under the supervision of a very famous fellow refugee, the sociologist Karl Mannheim, who was one of, not of the Frankfurt School, but an important interlocutor with the Frankfurt uh, community of um, Adorno and others uh, and uh, in, in, in Frankfurt, but who is famous as a sociologist of knowledge, but also one of the first sociologists of gender in and taught that in his uh, lectures at Frankfurt. Now, I have published a book. So this is my project, which is to make sense of how there could be a book on woman in art in 1944. What is she saying? What are the basis of it? What's the context for it? What's her interpretation of it? What kind of art history was she offering? In a sense, the middle centuries of modernist art and modernist thinking or thinking about modernist art. So 80 years later, her little 100-page book becomes my 388-page book. <clears throat> 50 illustrations become 139. And so what we have put is we've put her original in full color in the middle of it, and it's sandwiched between a, an intellectual portrait of Helen Rosenauer as a thinker and my a series of eight essays which analyze the arguments, the structure, the cover, the bibliography, which I reconstruct, in order to provide a kind of an analysis of the book, as well as a portrait of the, um, the thinker. Now, now you see them in 1944, in a sense, here is a book 
about uh, a, a feminist analysis of the history of art from the beginning to the present. And there are issues around this basic issue about artist women, because in 2024, we are still discovering women artists as if they weren't seen, but this is the proof that they were seen. These are the art, the works by women artists that are illustrated in Woman and Art without any fuss, whether that's uh, Hildegard of Bingen, Sophie Nisba Anguissola, Artemisia Gentileschi, Angelica Kaufman, Dorothea terbush Lisievska, um, Anna terbush Gaska, who is the sister of it, Kate Kolwitz, Paula Modersen Becker, Vera Mukina, the Soviet sculptor of the famous couple on the the, the pediment of the Soviet um, uh, pavilion in 1936 in Paris, Marie Laurent René Saint Denis, the sculptor Stella Bowen, the Australian, the unnamed Santal women painters of northern India, still operating, and finally we have Barbara Hepworth the British sculptor who's represented by two works. Now, drawn from life, she draws upon Stella Bowen's uh, autobiography, which has been republished in many ways. And this is René Centinis, who was a German artist, but uh, written very interestingly about by Crevel in Paris and very, very visible in her own time. Now, this is a book of 500 self-portraits published by Feiden Press as it moved from Vienna as a refugee press and was reconstituted in London. And I show you this to show that books of this sort included women artists in 1937. And you can see here the list of historic artists, including uh, René Sintenis. And these are the ones that you've just seen that are illustrated by um, Rosenau, probably drawn from this book as well. So now you see them, but because of something that happens in the middle of the 20th century, where now you don't, contemporary feminist art history for the last 50 years has been trapped in the mode of recovery with a resulting focus on artists. So if we look at this exhibition that's just opened in the autumn in Madrid at the Museum Tyson, sorry, this goes forward, again, Maestras, using the feminized version of Maestro, the teacher or the great master, it's reported in the press, Maestras recovers great female artists who are unknown and forgotten by history. Now this legend that all women artists are unknown to be rediscovered is something that we must culturally, ideologically, and linguistically challenge. And we can pinpoint the moment that this happens. It's not that women artists were never recorded. They're recorded from Vasari and even from Boccaccio or even from the classical period Pliny, right? They obviously become more numerous at different times and they negotiate different conditions. Some include exclusion from institutions, or some include ideologies of, of gender, which says women can't be seen in certain places or can't study from the nude, all these things. But women artists persistently, consistently create as much because of as despite the limitations that are placed on them. But at a certain point, and I pinpoint it, six years after Helen Rosenau is presenting her study of women in art with women artists, Gombrich, Ernest Gombrich, a young um, a refugee scholar, is commissioned by Feiden to produce a book called The Story of Art, which is in fact not a story of art because Gombrich says there is no such thing as art, there are only artists. And the only artists he will acknowledge are artist men. Now, I'm not, I'm putting that in because if I say artists and women artists, it means masculinity occupies the space of the artist by default, by nature. And women have to be qualified. And that qualification, woman or black or queer, disqualifies them from the neutral category of artist that is default occupied by European masculinity and probably heteromasculinity. Okay? But we see this as well, that this is repeated by uh, Werner Haftmann when he writes the history of the painting in the 20th century, uh, only artist men. 
It was forerun by uh, Alfred Barr, who traveled across Europe in the 1920s and 30s to visit every studio, whether it's in Montparnasse or in Moscow or in Berlin or Frankfurt or London. And what he would have seen is men and women working side by side to co-create modern art. But when he returned to New York and created his great story of cub cubism to abstract art, there are no women. Now, this is not because they were invisible or forgotten. They are excluded under a rubric which is being produced concomitantly with a version of the story of art that flies in the face of all the visible evidence and all the documentation. And then Barr's student, another refugee art historian, John Reyvelt, under Barr's supervision, creates the history of the pre-modern moment of Impressionism with equally ex excluding the women who were financial and exhibiting and intellectual partners in the creation of the Impressionist Exhibition Group, which is the first egalitarian art movement at the foundations of modernism. So any study of modernism has to deal with this particularly paradoxical situation of the increasing participation and what I call co-creation of modern art by men and women in these little coteries all across Europe and the United States and across different city centers in different parts of the world. But we get a story produced because, and what the problem is there, that if we have no women artists, we learn nothing about mo uh, modern art made by women. So we have no visions of modernity from diverse women's different perspectives. Right, because it's not we wish to say this is a women's perspective and then all these men, because the center of the discourse of art history that focuses on artists is we give permission to the artist to speak in the first person. We expect them to speak in the first person. It becomes a, a discourse of individualization and individuality, which is uh, how the story of the modern artists, not of modern art, uh, gets produced. So this is why the story of art by Gombrich is a story of artists. Cubism abstract art is a story of artists. History of Impressionism is a story of artists. But you have, are inclu excluding women from the co-creation of modern art by excluding the notion that there are any women artists. And the evidence is so palpably there that this forms one of the major paradoxes we have to so why Now we see them, now we don't. Now, this has meant that a certain kind of feminist art history has been forced into being an act of recovery and reconstitution, which also collectivizes women artists into a category of women artists, which is why in English I use the word artist men and artist women, not women artists. Now, uh, a different kind of approach was taken in Britain with Germaine Greer, who does a psychological portrait of how patriarchy damages the egos of women. And that's why there are no great women artists because you can't produce great art with a damaged ego. That's her argument. I don't agree with it at all. Uh, Old Mistresses, Women Art and Ideology, Rosie Parker and I wrote in order to say what the Americans are doing with this recovery of women artists does not get at the key point, which is, how does art history become such an ideologically patriarchal discourse that it simultaneously excludes women from the category of artist, but needs them to be repeatedly produced as the negative? So there's a double structure. You produce, uh, you want to produce an image of the great individual masculine artist. You must always have the foil, the negative, which is the follower the decorative, the weak. So in fact, we find a discourse of inclusion of women in order to be this foil of the negative by which the masculine is seems to be spontaneously the obvious hero of the story. And in France, you have <clears throat> a similarly structural analysis with Françoise Daubonne, who's not being celebrated in France, has largely been forgotten except by a number of 
emerging feminist art historians who in 1977 wrote the Histoire de l'art, la lutte des sexes in response to the Marxists <clears throat> who wrote the history of art and the lutte des classes. So she's suggesting that at the same level of materialist, economic and social analysis of the deep structures of society, we have to acknowledge not merely production as the Marxist analysis, but also she draws on Claude Lévy-Strauss, um, particularly I'm going to mention that in a moment, the structuralist anthropology that says society is built on exchange and exchange is the basis on which a social division, a cultural and symbolic division is made between two types of human beings. That what we call gender, masculinity, femininity is produced in order to facilitate a, a, a kind of exploitation and exchange of women, just in the same way that the bourgeoisie and the proletariat do not represent two types of humanity, but an effect of uh, a socioeconomic division of human beings into uh, the appropriators and the expropriated. Uh, French art history took a while to come to um, Les Femmes Artistes, the women artist story, but there are, uh, under the work of uh, Fabienne Dumont, uh, this exploration of how feminism theorizes the deuxième sex, this question of producing this um, asymmetrical hierarchy between masculinity and femininity that was the subject of de Beauvoir's analysis. And then using that, this the rebellion du deuxième sex, or a title like Des sorcières comme les autres, Artistes et féministes dans les, la fin de les années 70. This is uh, finding different names uh, for the practice of women artists. And here is uh, Daubonne herself uh, and the structure élémentaire de la parenté, which she is mobilizing not only for the study of art history, but for her sense of the planetary disaster. So 1972, she's founding ecofeminism with the notion that un unless we undo patriarchy, the planet is going to die. And we know that's the case with how patriarchy has morphed and become an adjunct to capitalism and industrialization. So I want the first point I want to make is we must stop using these passive verbs, forgotten, hidden, and actually ask who forgot, who knowingly erased all women as artists, who decided modern art was only made by mostly white men, who denied the evidence in the documents and on the walls of the studios? Who witnessed women and men side by side co-creating modern art and chose only to buy or sell or collect or write about the white men and one or two women? Who distorted the historical truth for two generations that leads us to the present where we're in this recovery or re-explanation mode, always with these women labeled as women and forgotten and hidden and overlooked and the suspicion, of course, there must have been a reason. So we have to work out why was the erasure of artist women a symptom and then became the defining character of modernist art history. In the, i.e. in the 20th century where everything that could have been obstructing women's access to their um, economy, to the profession, to training, to studios, to the world of exhibition. When that was all possible, art history denied them their existence. So let's go back to what Helen Rosenau offers us as a uh, interruption of that. Right in, written in 1944, how did she conceive a feminist intervention through the concept of woman in art, not women artists, and this title, subtitle, From Type to Personality. So on the left is the book that has just been published, which incorporates the reprint, but also is an intergenerational excavation of a lost memory, because when I first became a feminist art historian in the 70s, I did not know she had existed, even though she died 14 years after I began my own research and was at some of the his conferences I went to and had taught at my own university. Now the concept she gives us is woman as symbolic form and art as symbolic form. So I need to explain what symbolic form is. So we have a little philosophy lesson here. 
The concept of symbolic, symbolic form is the contribution of Ernst Cassirer, who is trying to mobilize a kind of neo-Kantian question of how we think against the Hegelian um, model, which becomes part of the sort of teleology of, of certain kinds of art history. And he defines a uh, symbolic form as language, science, myth, and art. And he defines a symbolic form as any impulse of the mind by which an intellectual meaning is attached to a concrete sensible sign and is intimately appropriate to that sign. So this is before we get the language of semiotics, but of course, Saussure has already begun to introduce into language the idea of a, a, a an element of meaning composed of a signifier, some sensible material component and a signified, a conceptual component, which have to be uh, made intimate with each other. In a sense, language, any form of language, the mythic, mythical religious world of myth and art present themselves to us as particular symbolic forms. A little bit more philosophy just before we get down to the concrete. So if there is symbolic form across myth, language and art, we have a signifying content of an intelligible order attaches itself to a concrete sign of a sensible order in order to identify profoundly with it so that we hardly know the difference between the signifier and the signified. And this is what, of course, Barth from mythologies in, in 1956 onward began to mobilize the legacy of this analysis to contemporary and popular culture. Now, the philosophy of symbolic forms, which is the philosophy of man's symbolic function, or should we say human symbolic function, sets itself the task of understanding the specificity of each of these activities. So the philosopher now wants to distinguish between these different operations which have in common that they are symbolic forms. Myth is the imaginative objectification. Art is an intuitive or contemplative process of objectification and language and science are conceptual objectifications. So there's a distinction of these different types of thinking and meaning making. But this is the one that I, I really want to stress with this. The specificity of artistic activity is that art teaches us to see things and not simply to conceptualize or use them. So here, the visual is not so much seen as the anti-conceptual, but it is a particular mode of thinking in terms of the sensible and the conceptual that makes us see, we contemplate rather than simply grip. So it is in this context of the, the monde rêvé des humanistes, the dreamland of humanists, as Emily J. Levine put it, Warburg, Kassira, Panofsky, and the character here is uh, Max Warburg. This is... Um, um, which is Max, this is Abi Warburg, this is Max Warburg. And I'm going to say that what we need to have is Helen Rosenau as the feminist interruption of this patriarchal all male canon of what this moment of uh, engagement with uh, the philosophy of symbolic form that Kassira put forward. And here is the, uh, the, the Warburg's interest in how does the image become a system of thinking and transmission and memory. And of course, Panofsky's first book, written just before he became her supervisor, Helen Rosen, our supervisor, is perspective as symbolic form, i.e. that space becomes, you can interrogate space as it appears in pictorial form as an indicator of mentalities, changing uh, historical mentalities for making sense of this key dimension of lived experience, but also as we produce images of space in architectural form and also in representational form. So I'm going to put woman in art in this uh, company at this level of intervention in art history. Okay, now let's look at how we encounter and what is the argument that's already being presented to us uh, in um, the uh, cover and its subtitle in how we can imagine 
imaging and making visible a certain conceptual but sensible materialized form. So we have uh, three images, the same in three angles, back, sideways, and frontal, which is of the most, one of the most ancient works that we have dating to something like 33,000 years ago. So very much obviously developed enough in a culture, but indicating a very, very ancient way of symbolic thought in our long distant ancestors, but also a contemporary work by, uh, this one is single form by a contemporary British modernist sculptor. Now, what is interesting about this figure, which is you can see already they try to prop it up, they present it to us visually always as if it's an upright. There's no evidence it was a standing sculpture. I think it's very largely likely to have been a grave good lying on its back in various sorts of ways, and you'll see that in a moment. But this is maintained. And the important thing about this work is it didn't exist in the human imagination until 1908. That is the moment at which it is excavated. It enters into our art historical um, culture at the point at which modernism is itself throwing off its tutelage, the arts, Western arts tutelage to the classical or the Christian traditions of art, reaching into the pre-classical or those that come from outside the Western tradition. But it's erupting out of the soil in Austria, showing that it was actually made somewhere near Lake Garda in Italy. It's, a travel, it's traveled great distances to be found there. And <clears throat> it's quite a sophisticated piece of <clears throat> sculpture, excuse me. And how, and she relating it from 33,000 years ago to a 1937 sculpture made by Barbara Hepworth. Uh, a British sculptor born in Yorkshire and part and parcel of a very uh, urgent and developed and uh, um, modernist group in London in the 1920s and particularly 1930s and onwards, abstract sculptor, also part of Creation, uh, what is it, uh, what is it, uh, Abstraction Creation, very much in contact with the, the French community and as well the international community, Gabo and all the others who came through through Britain. Um, this is Hepworth in 1930, her passage to abstraction coming through this archaism, this inv invocation of the non-classical work that was being discovered through archaeology. And this work was exhibited as a very breakthrough work of Barbara Hepworth in 1937, and it's there that Helen Rosenau saw it. So her book is absolutely with the most contemporary work, and she wrote to Helen to Barbara Hepworth and corresponded with her to ask permission. And there's an interesting record in Barbara Hepworth's um, correspondence about being approached and how interested she was in what Helen Rosenau was saying. Now here is Barbara Hepworth in 1932 with a figure which is going on the process of stripping away from figuration and coming to more and more kind of symbolic representations of a standing figure, but clearly with a female body. And I want to stress that because it wants to echo to this is the Willendorf figure, no, Venus is here, perceived as it's preserved in the Kunsthistorisches, uh, Nat Natur Kunsthistorisches Museum or the Naturhistorisches Museum in, in Vienna, um, and shown lying on its back. And what I want you to draw attention to is that when you make it an upright figure, it has a certain um, formality and you think of it as a, a mature woman with full breasts and perhaps a sort of a, a post-pregnant belly and so forth and so on. But when you see it lying down, you have a landscape. And this is very interesting because many of the uh, developments of um, this Neolithic kind of architecture on landscapes are these uh, mounds and various uh, fascinating ways of thinking of them as extensions and projections of this body in miniature onto a grand scale. But when we add this to that, this moment of modernism coincides with the breaking open, the back doors of uh, Western Christian history, 
which may go back to certain parts of the Middle East through the ways in which it appropriates, you know, the Jew Jewish texts and histories and Egypt as well. But these are so many thousands of years prior to the recorded archaeological histories of discovered of, of Egypt and co, that they only surface like the Lascaux caves. I mean, the Altamira caves are discovered in 1878, but only confirmed in about 1905. The Willendorf things come out at 1908. The Lascaux caves discovered in 1940. And of course, Georges Bataille's famous book about the um, Lascaux or la naissance de l'art is published in 1955. So these ancient elements are part of a modernist imagination, fertilizing it and indicative of this uh, transformation of art from the classical or Christian uh, theologies or uh, ideologies, in a sense, to discover something uh, that they see as not more primitive, but more authentically originating of the impulse to create art. And this links with the fact that Barbara Hepworth was part of the community led by and, and theorized by Herbert Reed, who founded the first Institute for Contemporary Arts in London in 1944 or 45. And one of their first exhibitions in 1948 was this exhibition, 40,000 Years of Modern Art, a specific comparative of what they call primitive and modern, uh, which of course you can see here with the Cycladic figures and a contemporary work uh, by a contemporary sculptor. And I I just want to say this question of the axis matters because Cycladic figures are always exhibited in the museums as if they are classical statues. And it's important, when did the figure stand up? What is the signification of the standing figure or the upright figure in the emergence of Egyptian and, and Greek classical art compared with the reclining figure or the grave figure or the figure on its back? And also, what is the language of these bodies, which you see with the crossed arms, that although people call the Villandor fi figure a Venus, it's not a Venus at all in one sense. It's, it's a figure of life, and they are also the figures that are engraved as the figure of death, which is, again, the symbolic, con the conjunction of the symbolic notion of life and death with a particular um, derivation of the female body, um, that can either be, again, this crossed arms uh, with certain features of the body which matter. So these are not images of women, but the focus of certain ways of thinking that require the form of the female body to be thought, sometimes with faces, sometimes without heads, sometimes without elements. So when we come to look at the trajectory of her book from Willendorf, as it were, to a contemporary art. We're not looking at the move from figuration to abstraction, but how in that retrospect, modernist art practice can be read of a formulation, a new formulation, in the light of modernism's engagement with the recent rediscoveries of the processes and symbolic aesthetic works of pre-classical or non-classical art. And what they are trying to find is formulae in a Warburgian sense, for the figuration of singularity or the refiguration of relationality. And what is being stripped away are the theologies and ideologies that have accumulated in what we think of as figurative classical or the incarnation theology of Christian art in order to arrive at the conceptual symbolic form of the single figure or the group, or even the group in space, because this is called coinoid sphere and hollow. It's not just a twosome, it's actually a threesome. So when we look at this subtitle, Type to Personality, we've got philosophical and anthropological question of the symbolic form. How do you produce something that becomes condensed to the point at which we think of it as a type that can be reproduced? We find Panofsky also using this. But also, we are looking at a sociological and psychological issue, personality. We're going to need theories of the subject. But you're also looking at a sociological one in terms of modernization, which means individualization and intensified sense of subjectivity, 
which is again a very important movement in which literature enhances as well. But you are once you enter in modernity, you've got two major revolutionary forces. One, the revolution that produces class and then the resistance to class society, but also the modern period witnesses the revolution on the ground of gender. So feminist art history didn't start in the 1970s. We're dealing with a revolution which has its prehistory in the medieval, right the way through to the 16th and 17th century, particularly in Protestantism and philosophy, and certainly from the 18th century, definitely from the 19th century, and continuing to this day. So when we then put Helen Rosenau's history, which culminates in contemporary modern art, as far as she's writing, up to date, literally getting a work that's only five or six years old on the cover of her book, in relation to Cuba's this Alfred Barr, which I have used a lot in my work, what we're seeing in Alfred Barr's thing is the erasure of history because you've simply got chronology. So nothing in those dates are telling you that there was a, a, a you know a Cuban you know, Cuban revolution. There was um, you know a, a Russian revolution. There was a, a world war. There was the depression. Right. There was the rise of of Marxism. There was the rise of fascism. Nothing is given to you, but instead you have a telos, a development to his notion of where art should go, which was from non-geometrical abstract art, it would move into abstract expressionism. And of course, that's what the Museum of Mart then puts in as the next phase in the 1940s, because it has to, because its logic is leaving there. And in the originals of them, he marks all of them with not just Gauguin, Van Gogh, Seurat and Cézanne, but he puts in the names of all the key male artists who represent these. Whereas Rosenau is giving us a model of the study of a longer history, but also a study of the present as both transformation and also the mobilization of memory. So it's not moving towards a telos, it's got a different combination. And where she draws that from is from Karl Mannerheim, who told you, who was the supervisor of her work at the LSE, where um, his major work is to ask, how do we study the social history of thinking? How do we study the way we understand the world? How do we study different mentalities? Now, if you're a trained art historian, you may have read Alois Regal, who posited this question with the concept of each era or areas of having a Weltanschauung, a single shared mentality or global view, which penetrates all elements of material and aesthetic and symbolic culture in a particular period or phase. But Mannheim is the first to sort of theorize this as that knowledge is always situational, historical, and existential. Knowledge is situational because it takes place in a particular configuration of political, social, generational uh, being. So the children of the people who took everybody to war in <clears throat> 1914 are post-war have a completely different sense of their situation from those who took the, into imperial war, as indeed I had a completely different sort of existential situational thing from my parents who lived through the Holocaust and the Second World War. So thought, these mentalities, is situational, generational, historical, and also existential because we, we live it as mentalities. But also he divides knowledge or, or into two elements. Ideology, which is the dominant form of knowledge, the one that people present as this is the way the world is, which actually obscures the systems of thinking in their diversity and maintains the status quo. Whereas utopia is that part of thinking which is a diagnosis of the present and an imaginative theorization of potential transformation that could be initiated through social change and is precipitated by generational difference. So my moment of feminism is different from Helen Rosenau's moment of feminism, as are young people now born after, you know, 1989 or after 2001, and certainly anybody born after and coming to maturity after 2007 with the smartphone 
These are very important di di divisions within our experience of the world. But this is, I think, a very useful tool. <clears throat> and I want to put now Rosa now in this context of feminism in the 1940s, which she installs in art history, but is happening in sociology in different ways. So one of the other people supervised by Mannheim is Viola Klein, another Jewish refugee finding their home in Britain, who wrote a book called Feminine Character, The History of an Ideology, I, the ideology of gender as this hierarchical differentiation of human beings. Now, whether we think there is a major difference between men and women, what we are dealing with here is that society has in asserted that this difference matters in law, in theology, in sociology, in economic and political terms. So we are confronting not a question, is there actually any difference between men and women and does, where does it come from? We have to have the ideology of that this difference matters enough for us to make this distinction so powerful that at a certain point in history, those considered women revolt against the limitations of their humanity in that name. So this bypasses all this question of Butlerian gender identity. This is not relevant to this argument at this point. So you can see in the, the, the book that she's reading, she's looking at all these different ways in which patriarchal and phallocentric thought continues to persist and produce these um, theorizations of gender in the modern period. Havelock Ellis, Otto Weiniger, Sigmund Freud, Helen Thompson, the Terman and Miles, the Matthias and Mathilde Ferting, Margarita Mead, W.I. Thomas. How are these different discourses, psychology, philosophy, psychoanalysis, um, uh, historical, anthropological, and sociological, process, all configuring a sense of there is a feminine character. They are fixing an ideology of the feminine. Some of them may well be producing a resource like uh, psychoanalysis for challenging it. And I put this in the context, instead of seeing Simone de Beauvoir as the sort of mid-century founder of feminism that finally comes to fruition in the 1970s, she is side by side also thinking through the 40s, what is this myth? What is it? How is this question of the patriarchal masculinity as a norm in the world produced using obviously existential philosophy of the situated subject? And she's analyzing again the data in destiny, biological, psychoanalysis, historical materials to say this is the way history has determined you. History myths, how does contemporary writers? Again, modernist writers like Montelon, D. H. Lawrence, Claudel, Breton, Stendhal, why are they producing this hierarchical asymmetry that they hold onto? What is what are they resisting by installing it as a law of, of society? And it's countered by reading the inscriptions by women in uh, narratives, memoirs, novels, lived experience, autobiographies in which she explores the effect of, of, of phallocentrism and patriarchy on women, where are the spaces in which we can think that, which you can also see has generational, as situational, as um, various responses, psychological responses, narcissism, the mystic, but also political, the concept of the independent woman. So we put that in that place and we are going to disown the particular kind of myth, particularly the myth of the eternal feminine, which, as she says, projects this myth into a platonic heaven, grasped through experience or conceptualized, and substitutes this situatedness for a transcendent idea. And as I say here, to the dispersed, contingent, and multiple existence of women, mythic thinking unifies them as woman, and it poses this eternal feminine as unique and fixed. And in that case, women who contradict this myth are treated as if they are bad women, failed women. That's what they call feminists, these women in revolt against the truth. And difference is a project 
that's what obviously existential census is living different is a project it's not an essence so she says that if it if it is true that women is other than man this alterity is concretely felt it's lived in desire in embrace in love it gives rise to authentic dramas for eroticism love friendship and their alternatives to disappointment hatred and rivalry the relation of consciousnesses each of which wants to be essential is taken to be the truth of itself and it's but in the recognition of freedoms that confirm other people's freedom it is the undefined passage from enmity to complicity now this is very crucial because we haven't got that sense that what Ever we're arguing about is that we have to allow all forms of humanity to live side by side, and whether we're talking about race or sexuality or is it what I call sexual difference as opposed to gender, the question is how do we create these passages to complicity, to freedoms that confirm each other, right? But if we posit the woman, we posit an absolute other, or the black person, or the queer person is the absolute other without reciprocity and we refuse against experience that our others could be subjects could be a peer so this is a very critical question now one other person i want to bring in because of course julia kristeva is a kind of perceived in in france particularly and in french theory as as it were the next generation from simone de beauvoir who writes about le temps des femmes and why this matters is art history is trapped in what she calls the linear historical time of the nation, right? Linear history, the you know, development, go back to the telos in Marx, we write the history of modern art as if it's developing, as opposed to understanding it as an instance of monumental psychocorporeal time, which is dealing as that does with desire, with sexuality, with violence, with fear, with anxieties of life and death, with the nature of these passions of the human mind and the body. And while we have this linear time of, you know, the classical, the pre-classical, the classical, the, the, the modern, and this postmodern, as it were, which tends to get operated in terms of nations, France, England, Britain, Europe, Asia, Africa. We have all these big sort of corporate, you know, kind of figures like that. But running across them are social ensemble, ensembles, which we find across all these different divided schools of American art, French art, German art, Italian art, um, African art, Southeast Asian art, etc. And these are age groups, youth and students, but they're also sexual divisions. They're, they, why is there a women's movement? Why was feminism there? Because it's a revolt, like the students' revolt, against a generational and a sort of, as it were, the, the couple, the couple of, you know, parent and child, the couple of two, two people who are constituted as different. And they all relate not to production, as the Marxists say, but the survival of the species, life and death, the body, sex, and symbol. So these are very crucial for setting in place, particularly what Kristeva offers us for art historical research is the moment of what she calls the hinge between the body and meaning. So if I retrieve Kassira's notion of what kind of symbolic form art is, it makes something visible. It's not the imaginative, conceptual, objectivizing, it makes something visible. It explores that interface, that hinge between meaning, the signifier, and the body at the level of visual representation. So I'm going to place Rosenau's book as a work of monumental art history aligned with anthropological and psychological thought, which springs us from the cage created by Barr and all these others of a linear, progressive, Eurocentered, Christianocentered and patriarchal art history, which models the history of art as a story of artists, and by doing so, evacuates history or society, or even the idea as art as thought. It becomes art as expression, it becomes psychologized and subjectivized. Now, I'm sure I'm going on a bit long, so we're just going to go through this a little more quickly, 
what is the sub part of my text on femininity, modernity and representation, rethinking the 20th century with women in mind. Now, for many years, I had to work out how could I teach this? How could I create a curriculum or a, a, a master's and doctoral program for feminist studies in the visual arts, which wasn't about this artist or that artist. It was to grasp these this entanglement of the revolt of women, the question of specifying um, a, 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 an ensemble in history that had come to the political stage, women, but was exp exploring this question of why difference between human beings had become the foundations for sexual, economic, social, political differentiation and exploitation. How does this relate to modernity, which is shaking up society by industrialization and urbanization, and what we know from the great theorists of, of modernity, changing the mentality of people by virtues of these socioeconomic and political conditions, living the city. So we know about Baudelaire and the urban flaneur, we know Georg Simmel about the metropolis and mental life. This is the substance of the theory. So what is it to do that? So I wanted to ask people to think when they study and teach modern art, what concept of, emer of modernity emerges from the erasure of its implications for feminine subjects? These not being a single lump and category women, because they're always differentiated by class, sexual choices, culture, social location, political affiliation, and generation and geography. So in order to a feminist art history, we need a social historical approach to the historical conditions of women in these varying classes, ethnicities, and sexualities. We need feminist theory and feminist revisions of history to outline a provisional map of modernist culture in which questions necessary to the understanding of both women's creative participation, they are as co-creators of modern art, but also women appear have an allegorical place in the configurations of modernity. That's why we find, as it were, the figure of woman, this body of woman, um, like the, the Villendorf, so central to the ways in which cultures think their own mentalities and periods. And in a lot of feminist denunciation of modern art is a critique of the manner in which the great modernists, men, uh, use a uh, woman's body as a as an allegory an allegory of new sexualities of objection of the colonial and all these other forms and we finally need to develop both traditional and novel art historical methods including the classic ones documentation biographic information but with semiotic as well as formalist studies of art psychoanalytical theories of subjectivity and the psyche but also theories of myth and ideology. Now, there is nothing in conventional art history and the way of doing conventional art history that we get trained in that will help us solve these questions that feminism is posing to both the history of art history and to the analysis of art. We have to be part of an interdisciplinary cultural analysis. So whose modernity is presented to us as the modernity that modern art is dealing with? Here are your classic figures, Baudelaire, Benjamin, Georg Simmel, Adorno, right? What about women modernists? I'm sorry, we're going to leave Sigmund out of it for the moment, because the, there are genders of modernity, as Rita Felsky says. What is the gender of modernity, or what is the exclusion? And I just want to remind you that, uh, or introduce to you, the fact that when I analyzed the bibliography of Helen Rosenau, she was drawing on these 19th and early 20th century German founders of sociology and founders of the sociology of gender. Gertrud Kinnell, who married Georg Simmel, who wrote a book called Reality and Law in Sexual Life, and Marianne Weber. You may have heard of Max Weber, you know, Weber, Durkheim, Marx, um, and to some extent Peretti as the founders of sociology. We never include women, nor in fact in the histories of art history do we include Jane Harrison uh, and her analysis of the social origins of art in ritual. So I bring you this, these three together. But here is the work of 
Marianne Weber, that is obviously not taught in sociology and not taught in, in our things. But if you look at that, I want you to notice this question of marriage, of the wife and mother, the question of divorce, authority and autonomy in marriage, the valuation of housework, women and objective culture, women and love, the notion of the fulfilled life, and when we put that next to the categories that Helen Rosenau sets up, wives and mothers, motherhood, and further aspects of creativity, that is what it resonates with. Where are the points of interrogation of the existing system that are being investigated by critical feminist thinking that enables us to rethink these by means of a study of the image? Now. Is she doing this in a kind of builder atlas inspired by Warburg? Remember, she comes from and trains in Hamburg. And if so, what is the concept that these sets of images that appear in these chapters? So if you read them as wives and lovers, I want you to read them as explorations, as the ways in which images tr track over history from the Egyptians all the way through to Picasso, in uh, Barcelona in the 1900s, kinship, desire, and law. How is uh, kinship, desire, and orchestrated by law? The question of generation, affect, and life, through the which is what the figuration of the maternal body and maternal relations. And finally, these further forms of creativity are the arrival at singularity and agency, which of course is why the image track of that chapter ends up with René Sintenis or the self-portrait or the single figure uh, by um, um, Barbara Hepworth. So in the preparation for a book, there are a number of articles she writes, and I collected all these images where this figuration of the couple is not affirming heterosexual couples. This is interrogating the historical representation, which forges and makes that entity the central figures of its representation and transformation. So we have the Etruscans, we have the legal um, marriage of the meeting of right hands, we have Orpheus's, uh, you know, the passion of, of bereavement and the lost love that kills his wife the second time, we have the Cumic here, but we also have the emergence in the 20th century, both of a different kind of representation of the passions of the body, but also the activity of the mind here, the sociologists, Sidney and Beatrice Webb, founders of the LS, the London School of Economics, Marie and Pierre Curie, uh, Millicent Fawcett and her husband, whose first name has gone out of it, Henry Fawcett, who were the uh, leading figures in the campaign for the emancipation of women. Uh, the representation of the, this figure of generation generation relationship is not simple, but once you put it together on a cross-cultural basis, we see change and transformation, but we see diversity and multiplicity, religious law, divorce, working class sexuality, prostitution, and desire. All of these different terms, we see women, power, and politics. We see women, intellect, and poetics. We see uh, women as revolutionaries, we see women as theorists and creators, whether they are uh, sociologists or anthropologists or other sociologists or even a, a, a suffragette and composer of the Smythe. And in this sense, my reading of the book is woman as symbolic form articulates the social relations of kinship, the legal relations of marriage, as anthropology tells us, the erotic relations of desire, the passions of the body, the social roles within this almost universally imposed legal institution or theological institution of the heterosexual couple, and of course the effects that has on the uh, deinstitutionalization or indeed the abjection of anything other than that in terms of constraints on the diversity of human sexuality, the question of generational change, sorry, okay, of generational change, and at the same time, how the interruption of these different but continuing sim structures is changed by women's modern political struggle for creativity and agency. So this is why we are moving, not teleologically, but in terms of a revolution, eruption, 
So that feminism and the women's movements from the 18th century through to the 20th century are seen as cultural, intellectual, as well as political revolutions. This is the way I mapped out the 20th century, and I don't think I have time to, to talk about it. But as you can see, I'm not doing it movement by movement, but certain concepts like figuring the sexed body. How does a modern subject visualize itself as it changes the understanding of um, sexuality, sexual difference, um, middle class, working class, queer, all these different kinds of femininities that are going to emerge into representation. What is the culture's notion of the new woman? The sense that there is something happening in this field of this social ensemble of women. How do you modernize sexual difference by means of, whether it's literature or later film, how do you explore the question of women and the unconscious and sexuality? How do we reread the politics and poetics of Dada and surrealism? How do we look at that I call the écriture féminine that emerges in the moment of the 60s through minimalism and others? And how do you deal with what happened in the 70s? Why is the body, the black body, the sexual body, the, the damaged body, the, the maternal body, the, the migrant body, you know, the oppressed body, how do these come to be such central figures of um, a politics of representation in this space between the feminine and feminism. The 50s you'll see was missing, but this became this thing. And uh, thank you, Hugo, for mentioning this, but I've actually rewritten the, the 1996 essay as a full length book in 2020, because I felt that the foundations of the kind of feminism that I was using to study abstract expression was expressionism was disappearing. I had to put it back in place. Uh, so that at least it will be an archaeology for people. How did we think using psychoanalysis and semiotics to undo this? And what I'm proposing in that book is a triangulation. So I was asking how Lee Krasner could understand herself as a painter and a woman, if to be a painter in the 1950s iconically and critically was to be de Kooning or Jackson Pollock, and to be a woman was to be Marilyn Monroe. So that's the so it's not male female it's actually the negotiation of competing systems of representation and I reclaim Marilyn Monroe for agency and life I don't see her as a figure of sexuality I see her a figure of life in this Rosa now woke and that's my next book so what the space and then I want to come back to Rosa now feminist art history in 1949 and this question of then what how do we find the space for this book to interrupt the false narratives of a modernism without women and a feminist recovery of women, which is not being integrated into our histories? So thinking modernism with women on us, thinking woman, woman thinking art, leads us to my final point, which is just a little section of the book where Helen Rosenau confronts this work, a sculpture pre-modern in some sense, pre-1910 in your Fondation's uh, rubric by uh, uh, Auguste Rodin, because it's not a matter of women artists, it's a matter of reading the inscriptions of women in different practices. So Helen Rosenau's reading of this sculpture is important. Uh, it occurs in the context in which you can see her engaging with a number of contemporary artists um, and I was delighted when I found this archive postcard from 1913 from the Musée du Luxembourg of the very detail that she uses for her illustration in the book, an interesting angle, which compares, uh, which is, um, leads us to the fact that this is apparently carved from the face and therefore the mind of Camille Claudel, a sculptor who revolutionizes uh, sculpture in the intersection of intellectuality, the idea of sculpture as a form of thinking with sexuality, is punished horribly by her family by long-term incarceration and disempowerment uh, and impossible 
and unable to make her sculpture for the rest of her life, even though this were, these were such transgressive and transformative sculptures which moved the triggeration of passions of the body and desire and eroticism off the fixed axis of the vertical and the horizontal and made sculpture in its material making the moulage, the plaster, and then the, the clay and the plaster have a, a materiality which exceeds even our most revered sense of, of Rodin's origination. But this sculpture is contrasted by Rosenau to Le Penseur, the Michelangelesque, tragic, masculine nude uh, of uh, Dante Alighieri's contemplating purgatorio, contemplating his vision of hell that was to go on the gates of hell. And this different kind of musculation of this body, the figuration of masculinity as his body, as opposed to the representation of la pensée, of thought coming out of the um, marble body, is important because what Rodinau says, Rodinau says is, by contrast, Rodin's sensibility and instinctive symbolism is most revealing in modern art as regards the potential power of women. Rodin's attitude is being expressed by himself in a conversation with Paul Gussell when he stated, la réflexion très profonde aboutit très souvent à l'inaction, very deep reflection frequently arrives at or results in inaction. This intensive thought, which is not manifest in overt action, even in the anguish of Le Penseur, takes for Rodin a woman's shape. This is historically important. In his sculpture Le Penseur, he shows a figure bowed down and concentrating on the task of thinking, but his La Pensée illustrates the opposite. Out of an angular block, the neck and head of a woman arises. It's no longer the collective or the sexual aspect of womanhood which is expressed in a manner which um, denotes no effort, thought is represented. And how is it represented as the thought of a solitary woman as thinker? Now think how revolutionary that is. It's not a partner, not a mother, not a lover, not an erotic object, but the figuration of woman as a thinker. Now, our friend Paul Gassel is a bit shocked. He doesn't like it. He says, she's all trapped in the stone. It oppresses me. And Rodin replies, why are you reproaching me? It is by design, I planned this, that I've left my statue. It represents meditation. That is why it has neither arms with which to take action nor legs with which to walk. Have you not noticed, in fact, that reflection, when it is deepest, justifies plausible arguments for opposing decisions such that it counsels inertia, that this thought is about all the possibilities? So then Paul Gassel says, this woman, I then understood, was the emblem of human intelligence that has been urgently animated by problems it cannot resolve, haunted by an idea it cannot realize, obsessed by the infinite that it cannot embrace. So this is a reading which then Helen Rosenard takes further by saying, this bust may take us back to Genesis, to the famous phrase for the beginning of the first act of creation, which is the first word of Genesis, is Bereshit, in the beginning, and then it says God created. So what was the source of creation, which was the spirit of God moved upon the faces of the water? Now, Rosenau is saying the Hebrew text uses the word ruach, spirit. Now, in French, you have esprit, which can be mind or spirit. It goes either ghostly or kind of intellectual. But this is the same thing in its feminine form, a grammatical feminine. And in this manner, a gulf in time is bridged by Rodin's inspiration. Now, my commentary is that breath, the Hebrew for ruach, and ruach means breath. It's translated as spirit because it's the animating but invisible force. Now, what is happening in the Hebrew version of Genesis, Merachafet, is not moving upon the waters, but hovering, brooding, which comes closer to Rodin's sort of suspended action. And what the Hebrew reads is Adonai Elohim merachafet al panei hamayim. It's hovering over the 
the void over the waters that have no form. So you've got breath and water. And this is where um, Helen Rosenau says that he quotes the profound thought immediately leads to an action. But the word ruach has a masculine as well as feminine meaning, which has provided a sense of getting us out of the notion of uh, feminizing and excluding as opposed to how the feminine and masculine in, in grammar becomes a way of thinking, a kind of a differences of different kind of forces. And when we see the philosophy of Levinas or Brechel Ettinger, Brechel Ettinger or Lucy Rigere, breath and becoming are, are absolutely central, which is already kind of intimated in this sculpture. And in the pages that they juxtapose, here is um, the road and things, is juxtaposed to Marie Laurassin, who would for many seem to be the very opposite of Rodin's you know, masculinity and so and this even the masculine power to evoke this figure. Um, but of course, in recent research, uh, it's been linked with a different femininity, a sapphic femininity, a queer femininity. And in the most recent exhibition about Marie Laurence, she's been saved from Apollinaire and all the others who see her as a sort of failure in terms of cubism and abstraction, but understanding it as an inscription, not of the male dominated cubist avant-garde, but a lesbian literary artistic circles, which played with different realms of representation, fashion, ballet, the decorative arts, um, in this question of a kind of a sapphic, a feminine queer, as opposed to one sense, a different kind of masculine queer that we see in uh, René Sintonis. And this sapphic modernity I wanted to bring in because we can't stay in a heterosexist vision of masculinities and femininities. What is constantly repressed by the masculinization of modern art is both the diversity of masculine subjectivities and sub and sensitivities and sexualities but particularly the complexity of different kinds of desire uh, in the feminine as it were and so i want to sort of end by these are my three sort of points that the 19 oh the the um villandor figurine becomes part of the discourse at the beginnings of your modernism la pensee is part of the symbolist aesthetics of the pre-modern which gets repressed by the formalist discourse, fails to see all abstract art as it emerges is a form of symbolic articulation of the intellectual and the aesthetic. And we've come to Barbara Hepworth's single figure, even though it's an upright form, it's a non-phallic form in very precise way. That if you look at the triangulation of the, of the, the sculpture as it sits on its cubic base, and then you see that the angles in which you are going to see it have a, a flat plane, but also have a, a curving form, no longer, as it were, protuberant as focusing on the kind of fullness of the breasts or the belly or the hips or the thighs, which mattered to the probably very hungry, often starved, um, uh, Neolithic people coming out of the end of the Ice Age uh, and surviving and why this was such an important figure that there should be weight on the female body through to the symbolist aesthetics of this figuration of the materiality of the stone, the the, the allegory of, of Rodin's own sculpturalness, that this is material out of which thought comes from the material and gives itself a shape, but the shape is that of a woman as the figure of meditation and beginning. And here, I certainly think there is a figure there. So I'm going to stop right there and just end with this kind of sense of what we've been traveling through and what we need to talk about um, in our discussion. So now you see them, now you don't. I hope we've dis got discussed how femininity modernity representation is such a rich field and that we can rethink the 20th century with women in mind. Thank you for your attention.